silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright. I remember this song as a lullaby. Hearing it in my earliest memories. Last week we asked this congregation to share some favorite Christmas songs and how many of you have this as one of your favorite Christmas songs? Quite a few of you. This is the beginning, silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright. The first lyrics to one of the most beloved and widely sung Christmas songs in the world. A song that many of us might have learned as a child, a song that's been translated into 300 different languages, a song that in 2011 was made into a UNESCO heritage song because of the impact that it has had. And for a song that has been sung so widely and had made such an impact, in fact, I just discovered recently that the song has been recorded over 130,000 different times by different artists. It's interesting that this song is, in fact, not actually all that old. I came to today's sermon wondering to myself, what is it that makes this song so loved, so widespread and so well known. We're in a sermon series where we're talking about different Christmas songs that we hear week after week and we're looking at the gospel story that is in the kernel of this song so that when we listen to the songs week after week from here on out we'll see it through new lenses and hopefully be able to remember just what is at the kernel at the center of this song. And interestingly enough, the fact that Silent Night is so very popular is not guaranteed given its beginnings. I actually didn't know the history of Silent Night from the very beginning. Does anyone here know already the history of Silent Night, where it came from? We have a couple of people, our historians among us. But the song Silent Night, I thought maybe because it is so well known, maybe it was originally written by somebody very famous, a well-known composer, a well-known lyricist, somebody who was already famous so that when they did this song, it could be spread far and wide. My question, what made this song so popular and what are its origins, was not asked by, for the very first time by me right now. In fact, it was asked in the 1800s when King Frederick William IV of Prussia heard it for the first time. He heard it and he loved it. And there was one version of the story of the origins of the Silent Night that goes as follows. This story goes that King Frederick William IV heard the song and asked who wrote it because he wanted to list it in his list of Christmas songs to sing every year. But the choir didn't know who had written it. And he thought this was ridiculous. He, he asked somebody in his court to go around Eastern Europe and try and find out who had written this song. And so the search was on to compose it. Some thought it might have been Mendelssohn, some thought Mozart, some thought Haydn, some thought Beethoven. There's an element to the story that's only found in one part of the internet, so take this with a grain of salt. But in this version of the story, the song hunter went hunting throughout Eastern Europe, couldn't find the song, went to an inn, was heading back to the king of Prussia to tell him that he had failed in his search. And in that inn, there was a songbird. And he hears the notes of the song being sung by this songbird. And he leaps from his chair. He says, I've been looking for this song forever. Whose songbird is this? How did the songbird learn this song? And the innkeeper said, well, the songbird belonged to a monk at the monastery. And so he races over to this monastery and he says, oh, this was the monastery that Hayden went to. So it must be this fantastic name who, who created this song, Hayden. And it, it wasn't. And they find a nine-year-old boy who, who recognizes the bird and recognizes the song. And they ask this nine-year-old boy, who is, who 
how did you learn this song? Who wrote it? Who taught it to you? And he said, did, they asked him, did you learn it from some visiting great composer? And the little boy said, no, I learned it from my father. And the visiting song hunter said, your father, who was he? Was he somebody that we know, somebody famous? And the little boy said, no, my father is just a humble school teacher in a tiny village. Now, that version of the story with the songbird might be a little fantastical, but the actual story of the origins of this song is quite humble. The words weren't written by some great poet or some famous wordsmith. It was written by a local priest who was one of three illegitimate sons whose grandfather had been the town executioner. And he, one night, some versions say he was walking home after having visited a mother who had just given birth, and others say he was just walking through the fields when, when these words came to him, the words that became the lyrics of Silent Night. And it was during the time when the world, his world, the continent, was reeling from war. The Napoleonic Wars had just finished and in 1816, a man by the name of Joseph Moore wrote a poem called Stille Nacht to commemorate the coming of peace after a long time of war. He wrote these lyrics, and then he put the poem aside for two years, and then this version of the story, all the sources that I looked at agree on. He wrote the song, he put aside it for two years, and then one Christmas Eve he was in his local village and he was preparing for the Christmas Eve service, and the organ went out. Some versions say that the mice ate the organ, hopefully that doesn't happen here. Other versions say that it was a flooding that knocked the organ out, but for some reason the organ could not be played this night in 1818 in a little parish in Austria. So the congregation could have music on Christmas Eve. Joseph Moore asked his friend, a humble school teacher, somebody who had grown up very poor, but who was the local church organist, to write a song. And one day, he did it in one day, he asked him Christmas Eve to write the song. He wrote it in a couple of hours. He brought it to Moore. He said, here is the tune. And I actually didn't know that this was going to be, I actually didn't know that the original was written for guitar, not for piano or for organ, but the way that we played it this morning was the way it would have been heard 200 years ago for the first time in this little village. A simple guitar, two voices, silent night, holy night. But the story can't end there, because there are many songwriters in the world whose songs we have not heard. And this was a humble village with two people that nobody knew. What happened was when the organ um, fixer, that's not a word, the organ fixer came to fix the organ later, he heard this song and he enjoyed it so much that he took it back with him to a village nearby where a touring group of singers would come through. Think the sound of music. And this touring group of singers came through. They heard the song for the very first time. They took the song and they started singing it from village to village, place to place. And the song's popularity just exploded. And it grew, and it grew, and it grew, and it reached the king's court, the king of Prussia, and it moved over the ocean to America. It, by, the t by the 1839, America was full of silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright. For many years in the latter half of the 19th century, when the carol is beginning to become more popular, people who knew anything about Stille Nacht, as we said, assumed that it must have been written by somebody great, Beethoven, Mozart, who had actually written it, kind of fell into mystery. 
until about a couple decades ago where a letter was found in the handwriting of Joseph Moore and in the upper right hand corner it said Melody by Gruber. And so we have the backstory of one of the most famous Christmas songs written by two unknown men in a tiny village in Austria for a simple Christmas service. Nothing big, nothing fancy, something that was written because the organ was broken, written in 1818 on a Christmas Eve far away from the bright lights of the cities and the courtyard of kings. A song that didn't come from anyone famous, but came to an illegitimate grandson of the town executioner and a poor school teacher struggling to make ends meet. A song that came in a time where war had ravaged the country and the world and peace was hard to believe in. It started small, but it was a song that touched a chord with people and it was picked up and sung over and over, spreading from village to village, reaching courtyards and kings and the United States. That is excellent timing. What is it about this song? In today's day and age, we're familiar with the concept, especially those of us who are under possibly the age 30 or 25, we're familiar with viral songs, songs going viral. On TikTok age, you have a song that is, uh, you catch a snippet of it, and then overnight, millions of people had seen it. Songs can go viral, but they don't necessarily stay. They, they come and they go. There was something about this song that stuck, struck a chord, made it popular for over 200 years. I have a little bit of a confession to make for those of you who, for whom Silent Night is your favorite song. I haven't always loved the lyrics of Silent Night. Silent Night. I haven't always loved the lyrics of Silent Night for two reasons. The first is I've wondered whether that night was really silent. If any of you have been around a birth, births aren't generally completely silent. Or if any of you have been around a barn, animals aren't generally completely silent. So I've wondered about the accuracy of this words, silent night. But even more, I've struggled with the fact that silence, well, you know, I don't always find silence comforting. I, I think I've mentioned this before, I sometimes have insomnia and so I can stay up at night unwillingly for many, many silent hours. I don't love it. I can hear the clock ticking bit by bit by bit and it's silent and it's long. Some silences, well, some silences are painful. Painful silences. I came across a blog recently of a, someone who found this song very difficult. Her name was DeAndrea, and she writes this. She says, it's been six years since I've been able to fully sing the words to Silent Night. Andrea had lost her child. It was stillborn. She says, the mother and child, silent night, and especially sleep in heavenly peace lines just fall too close to those still painful pieces of my heart, reminding me of Max's silent birth and the silent nights that followed. I'll never forget my first Christmas Eve service after he died. I was standing at front of the candlelit packed sanctuary, looking out and praying that everyone was caught up in their own moments and not noticing that I was about to collapsed during the singing of that song. Millions of tears were sliding down my cheeks and after the service was over, I just wanted to hide. But before I could retreat into my office, a precious woman walked up to me and simply said, for some of us, it's a hard night. A silent night can be a hard night. Is there anyone here who has experienced painful silences? What are your painful silences, moments or times when you wished for an answer or a voice and you received silence instead? There are painful silences in scripture. 
In Isaiah 53, the prophet writes of someone who is to come and says, He was oppressed and was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. A painful silence. In Matthew, we see this prophecy come to fruition as Jesus stands before the governor and the governor asks him, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus says, you have said so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he gives no answer. Then Pilate says, do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he gives them no answer. He remains silent. A silence that becomes full of pain. In Exodus, there is a long, painful silence of 400 years where the children of Israel are in slavery and calling out to God, and it seems like there is a silence. Between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New, there are 400 years where we have nothing recorded in Scripture, a silence. Silences can be painful. In fact, silence can be so painful that people will do almost anything to avoid it. There is a study that I came across recently that was done by the University of Virginia. They did 11 experiments, and researchers asked participants to occupy themselves with only their own thoughts for 6 to 15 minutes. Not a long time to be silent. Only 6 to 15 minutes, but they couldn't do anything. They had to throw out the results of one of the experiments because somebody left a pen in the room accidentally and the person was using their pen. But they could do nothing for 6 to 15 minutes. And people felt so uncomfortable with this. We've become so attuned to have noise in our lives. People felt so uncomfortable with this that in one of the experiments, they willingly shocked themselves. They had a shock machine set up and said, you could just remain here in silence, or if you'd like, you can shock yourself. And people who said, no, I don't want to shock myself before the experiment, after minute three or minute four, got so uncomfortable with silence that they shocked themselves instead. A painful silence. I wonder if any of us might sometimes Be afraid of silence because it might reveal what is underneath. There's a painful silence, but there's also power in silence. I came across another blog that talks about the power that God can use silence for. They had four different four different things that silence can help us with, and the first one was silence reveals. When we commit to being quiet, silence can help us begin to notice all of the things inside that are desiring to come out, both positive and negative. One of the reasons people might dislike silence is because they aren't at peace with certain aspects of themselves. And they have a prayer for each of these sections. And so under silence reveals, they invite you to pray this prayer for the God who invites you into a time of silence. Bring to God those things that cause you inner turmoil or grief or the things that make you fear silence. Silence reveals the things we might want to cover up. Silence roots is the next one. In a busy and distracted world where so much is going on, silence can ground us in our current reality and make the external things matter less. It allows us to listen for God and root ourselves deeply in who he is. The prayer prompt for this is recognize where God might be calling you amidst the cacophony of other voices trying to get your attention. Silence can root us deeply in who God is. Silence can remind. It can be a practice of humility and comfort. Silence allows God to remind us that we don't need to do anything to impress him. He doesn't even need our words. We can just be. The prayer here is a reminder that you don't have to say anything for God to hear you. He knows your love and you can feel his in silence. And silence can restore Time away from distractions of the world 
and all that is going on, just resting in his presence. Just take in this next week even, 10 minutes in the midst of the bustle and hustle of Christmas, 10 minutes a day to be in silence with God. And you may find that the painful silences that you've experienced in your life turn into a type of pregnant silence. A pregnant silence is a silence that is full of possibility, full of hope. The story continues from Deandria. She was going to a Christmas uh, Christmas program with her other children, her, her preschool children, just like the Christmas program we had here on Thursday night, which was so beautiful, not silent. People were singing with their hearts out, but beautiful. And, and she goes to this Christmas program with her other children, her young preschoolers, and she is concerned about what songs they might sing. They sing away in the manger and she, she wipes her forehead in relief and then the teacher says, we have one final song. And her heart starts to constrict as they begin to sing Silent Night. She writes, one by one they begin to raise their little hands and sign the song. When my daughter raised hers, I nearly lost it. Tears, pain, joy, sadness, beauty, grace, peace, love, all of it was felt at once, and something beautiful happened in that moment. The images that always flashed in front of my eyes whenever I heard that song are of me holding Max for the final time. But when I went to bed that night, I did not go to sleep with those images erased or diminished, but with a new image to go alongside it. The sight of little children singing with their mouths and hands and hearts who led me to a place of remembering and understanding again what the season is all about. It is true that some of us may wait in the midst of grief and pain and beauty and love with great expectation. We hold it all together in tension, she writes. And I would add, in this silence, in a pregnant silence, we hold it all together with hope. Hope that the pregnant silence is going to become peaceful silence, a different type of silence. The type of silence that Elijah, the prophet Elijah, heard when he was feeling completely abandoned and lonely and sad, and God said to him, go, and I am going to reveal myself to you. And so God invites him to go to a cave, and Elijah goes to that cave, and he stands in the mountain, and behold, in 1 Kings 19, it reads, The Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks into pieces before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. God's voice. A peace-filled silence. The silence, the type of silence that comes upon the raging sea when Jesus is sleeping in the boat and the storm is swelling and people are saying, Lord, where are you? And Jesus stands up and says, peace, be still. That silence. The silence of Mary seeing shepherds and angels and pondering them in her heart, a heart full of wonder and amazement and hope and joy. And in Luke 2, verse 19, it says, Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart, in silence, but in deep peace. Perhaps the most famous story of Silent Night is a story that many of you may have heard. It comes just a little less than a hundred years after this song was first written in World War I, where British and German soldiers are lined up on either side of the trenches and they have been fighting for what seems like forever. I think about those who are lined up in trenches fighting today and wondering if peace will ever come. It said that about 30,000 or up to 100,000 soldiers participated in this event that happened next. 
an unusual event, an event that made the officers of the various armies so angry that they threatened and blustered and, and did everything they could so that this type of event could not happen again. I found a letter that was written by one soldier on the English side on Christmas Eve, 24, 12, 1914. He writes to his wife, I have just been through one of the most extraordinary scenes imaginable, he says. Tonight is Christmas Eve and I came up into the trenches this evening for my tour of duty. Firing was going on all the time. The enemy's machine guns were at it, hard firing at us. And then, about 7 o'clock, the firing stopped. I was in my dugout reading a paper and the mail was being dished out and it was reported that the Germans had lighted their trenches up all along our front. And they were calling out to us, shouting, no shooting. And somehow the scene became a peaceful one. And all of our men got out of our trenches and sat up on the parapet and the Germans did the same and we started talking to each other. And then somebody started singing, he writes. We find out later that in the German side, there had been an opera singer who was coming to, to bolster up the hope of the troops. And that opera singer turned towards the English side and sang the song Silent Night. And as they did, the people on the English side joined in. The letter goes on. He writes, it was a curious scene, a lovely moonlit night the German trenches with small lights on them, the men on both sides gathered, singing. He continues a little later. I felt I must sit down and write the story of this Christmas Eve before I went to lie down. Of course, he writes, no precautions are relaxed, but I think they might mean to play the game. All the same, I think I shall be awake all night so as to be on the safe side. It's weird to think that tomorrow night we shall be hard at killing each other again. If one gets through this show, it will be a Christmas time to live in one's memory. The German who sang, he writes, had a really fine voice. And then he continues, Christmas Day. We had a quiet night. We had a quiet night. I wonder when the war will begin again. He writes, we'll try and write more in a day or two. Keep this letter carefully and send copies to all. I think they'll be interested. Kiss the babies. Give them my love. Write me a long letter. Tell me all the news. I hope the photos come out all right. Probably you will see some in the paper. Yours, Jake. Silent night. A peace-filled silence. You know, the tragedy of this story is that war continued. But the hope of this story is that those who participated in this moment actually refused to shoot each other. The officials had to move them from that front and move them somewhere else because they had come together singing about a baby that came to bring peace. And because they came together and sang that song, they could no longer kill each other. There is something in this song, the power of silent night. We might have painful silences, it is true. But because of this story, this pregnant silence, it leads to a peace-filled silence. Church family, do these stories of silent night sound at all familiar that we've shared? We shared today that a song was born in a tiny village far away from bright lights and centers of power. Its writers were born to illegitimacy, born to poverty, born in humility, but wrote a song that changed the world. It's echoes, right, of another birth that happened 2,000 years ago. A birth that happened in a tiny village far away from bright lights and centers of power, born in Ill illegitimacy, born in poverty, born to humility, but a birth that changes our silences from pain to peace. Amen? What type of silence might you be experiencing today? 
Underneath the hustle and bustle of the season, when you slow down long enough to listen to yourself, is there a pain in the silence? If there is, I hope you know that in this season, there is hope. It is not just a painful silence, it is a pregnant silence because a baby is going to be born. A baby has been born that brings peace, a peace that passes understanding. I invite you, if you have any of this pain, to remember this story and remember this song in this season. Next week, we're going to be celebrating, celebrating with the song Joy to the World. It's going to be a time of of just absolute laughter and love and joy. But today, I invite you over this next week to give your silent prayers and longings and pain and hope to Jesus. We're going to end our time together singing this song, Silent Night, and I invite our praise team to come up forward. And as you sing these lyrics, I invite you, if your silences are painful, if your silences are pregnant, if your silences are peaceful, I invite you to sing this song with your heart, giving thanks to Jesus, our Prince of Peace.